Uh, We're going to be continuing our series this morning called The Gospel Throughout, where we've been looking at the gospel throughout the entire Bible. Uh, Now, we often think of the gospel as contained in like the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, But the reality is the gospel message is found throughout all of Scripture. So we're looking back at some of the, the, the biggest stories of the Old Testament and seeing not just how the gospel is present there, but how it plays a central role in those stories and how that affects how we live our life leading up to the birth of Christ. And this morning, we're going to be looking at the book of Judges, which is an incredible book, and I'm so excited uh, to look at that. But before we get there, let me ask you a question. Are people basically good, or are people basically evil? Are we good, or are we evil? Now, I know that question's been debated for a long, long time. Maybe you've thought about it. Maybe you've had some conversations with friends about it. But I think I have some insight into this question, because... I have a two-year-old at home. Now, I don't know if you've ever been around a toddler, but there's just something a little bit evil in them sometimes, is there not? I mean, I know in one minute they can be all cute and loving and and incredible, but then the next minute, like, just on, you know, a switch flips, and they can do something so incredibly bad. We have all the Christmas decorations set up in our house, and there's certain ones that we don't allow our son to touch because they're they're fragile or they're sentimental or something like that, and he knows what they are. He'll go up to him and say, no touch, no touch, no touch, over and over again. He knows he's not supposed to touch certain things, and one of the things he's not allowed to touch is our Christmas tree. And we've put most of the really fragile or really sentimental ornaments up high. Our, our tree is not balanced at all, uh, but we've put all the ones we care about up high, but we, we made a mistake of putting one a little bit too low. And it was like one of those, you know, glass balls. It didn't really mean anything, but it looked, it looked nice. The other day, he was getting a little closer to the tree. My wife said, back up, don't touch. And instead of listening, he chooses to grab the ornament, look at my wife, and throw it on the ground. And because that's funny to him, he then smiles and runs away giggling because that, to him, is enjoyable. It's a little bit evil, is it not? And listen, we're no better, are we? As adults, we are no better. We just know how to hide it better. But my guess is, you've probably done something bad recently. Maybe in the past few minutes. Maybe it was a thought you had. Maybe it was driving into church. Maybe this morning you treated your spouse or your family or a neighbor poorly. You've probably done something bad in the last few days multiple times. You see, we all have a little evil in us, don't we? And furthermore, if I said, if I said, hey, I want you to not sin, I want you to not do anything bad, I don't want you to do anything evil for the rest of December, how how long could you make it? Not long, that's right. (laughs) Most of us probably couldn't even make it a few hours. Because we have this evil inside of us that we just can't control. But are we evil? See, I would say no. No. Because in the beginning, God created humankind, and he said not that it was good, but that it was very good. When he created us, he said it was very good. But then sin entered the picture, and we know the story. Adam and Eve chose to do what God told them not to do, and sin entered into us. And so while we have this good inside of us, there's also this sin nature that just overtakes us. And it seems like we have no power to do what we actually know we should do, and instead we choose sin. We have this evil nature inside of us. And just like my son, who knows he's not supposed to touch the tree, sometimes he just can't help himself. He has to reach out and do what he knows he shouldn't do. And that's you too, isn't it? Whatever that tree is in your life, there are things in your life you know you shouldn't do that you know you should do, and you choose intentionally sometimes to do it anyway. And we're powerless on our own to fix that. We're powerless to deal with this evil that's inside of us. And you might be sitting here this morning thinking, man, this is kind of a downer. Like, I came to church to be encouraged. I came to be lifted up, and like now you're just telling me all the failures I have and make me recognize all the ways that I don't add up, but that's not my goal. You see, when we recognize the darkness that's inside of us, 
it makes the hope that we're going to look at all that much brighter. When we recognize how bad we are, it makes the love of God all that much greater. And that's what we're going to see this morning. We're going to look at the darkness of humanity in this book of the Bible. And I would encourage you, I would, I would invite you as we look at this to not just look at the darkness in them, but to use this as a mirror to see the darkness in yourself. Because when you see what's inside of you, it makes the hope that we have in God so much sweeter. So we're going to be looking at the book of Judges. And one of the reasons that I love the Bible is because it offers us a better way. You see, the Bible doesn't highlight just the good people. In fact, it doesn't really highlight any good people. It's not a book full of virtuous stories of us to follow. No, the Bible's not really even an inspirational story, at least not on the human side. It's really the opposite. It's a book full of stories of broken people doing some pretty terrible things. And there's not even really heroes in the Bible except for one. You see, the Bible, the Bible contains all these stories of humans making these incredible mistakes. And the story that we're going to look at next week is a guy that's named, that's called a man after God's own heart. And you would think, you would think of all the characters in the Bible, maybe this one, maybe this one would be able to deal with the darkness inside of him. But he can't. He commits adultery, covers it up with murder. Even the man after God's own heart has this evil inside of him that he cannot control. And what I love about the Bible is it never attempts to cover up or hide our messiness. Instead, it highlights it. It highlights the sin that we find ourselves stuck in and it invites us in our screwed up, messed up selves into something better. You see, the Bible is really about a God of mercy and long suffering who continually works in us and through us despite our brokenness. And that's what we're going to see today. We're going to see maybe the most screwed up book in the whole Bible, the book of Judges. And I love the book of Judges, because if anyone ever tells you the Bible is boring, tell them to go read Judges. There is some incredible stories. I mean, there's this story of this, this king where this assassin snuck in to kill him, and the assassin stuck, stabbed him, but then the knife got stuck in the king's fat, and the assassin had to run away. There's another story of this coward who would not believe in God, no matter how many signs God gave him. He kept not believing him. There's another story of this guy who sacrificed his daughter to a foreign god who tried to appease him. There's another story of this woman who, who, another assassin, snuck into this dude's tent and drove a tent peg, a tent peg, through his head. I mean, just incredible stories. Maybe my favorite story of all is this story of this sex-crazed maniac who has zero conflict resolution skills, so whenever he gets in trouble, he just kills people. And he goes around literally killing thousands of people and tying like foxes' tails together and burning fields down. I mean, you can't make it up. It's an incredible book. And I wish we had time to get into some of these stories, but we we don't this morning. It would be an entire sermon series in itself. So what I want to do today is I want to look at the overarching story. I want to look at the overarching story of Judges and see what that holds for us. See what that teaches us about the darkness inside of us and our need for a better way. So go ahead and turn your Bibles to Judges chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 16 or flip there in your phones. Uh, And as you're getting ready for that, let me just give you a little bit of history of what Israel or where Israel is at this point. You see, this Judges takes place before the time of the kings and before there's, you know, this established government. Uh, For this time, Israel is still in their infancy and they've mostly been wandering around the area for, for many, many generations And they finally, in the beginning of Judges, arrived in the promised land. And and the people, the second they arrive there, people keep doing what they've always been doing and rebelling against God. So God raises up these judges to lead them back to him. And that's kind of this, what's happening in this book of Judges. It's the the system of the judges where God raises up judges to lead his people back to him. And what we're going to see in Judges chapter 2 is we're going to see kind of a summary of what's about to unfold in the coming chapter. So let's check this out. Judges 2, verse 16. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who were afflicted. And oppress them. 
But whenever the judge died, they turned back, and they were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he said, because, because this, people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died in order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their fathers did or not. So the Lord left those nations, not driving them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. Now, if you were to read the entire book of Judges, you would see the same cycle played out over and over and over again. There's different characters, but the story is the same. They're stuck in this cycle. And I have this picture to kind of, kind of give you like an idea of what the cycle of Judges looks like. And what you'll see in this, in, this, in this image is this cycle of Judges always starts and continues the same. The first one is Israel did what was right in their own eyes. Israel did what was right in their own eyes. In other words, they rebelled against God. They went off and they did whatever they wanted to do. They did what was evil in the sight of God. And eventually God said, all right, I'll let you do that. I'll let you do that. But you're going to suffer the consequences. Eventually they would find themselves oppressed. They'd find themselves conquered by another nation. And sometimes for many, many, many years... Eventually, the people would cry out to God and beg for mercy and and ask for him to rescue them, and God would raise up a judge, and the judge would lead them back to the right way of living, and the people would once again do what was right in God's eyes. But soon, they'd fail, and the cycle would start all the way back over again, and you literally see this cycle played out over and over and over and over again. Different characters, different years, but the same story. The nation of Israel is stuck in this cycle. And here's the problem. Here's here's the problem that's laid out in the book over and over again, Judges 21, 25. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. If you read Judges, you'll see that over and over again. They did what was right in their own eyes. They did whatever they wanted to do. And listen, if that's not a description of our own time, I don't know what is. See, this book was written in a time of spiritual pluralism where you live your truth, you do what you want to do, and I'm going to live my truth, and I'm going to do what I want to do. And as long as your truth doesn't tell me what I need to believe, what I need to do, we're good. But there's no ultimate authority. There's nothing, no ultimate authority that gives us guidance, that sets some of the base rules, the base guidelines. We just all do what we want to do. And that attitude led the nation of Israel to a whole slew of, of problems. It got them stuck in the cycle, and God let them. God let them face their consequences to their actions, and when they realized it, they'd repent. God would rescue them, and they'd soon forget and do it all over again. You see, time and time again, they did what was right in their own eyes rather than obeying what God said was right. Now, be honest with yourself. You see yourself in this story? Do you see yourself in Israel? I mean, I know for me, I'm, like, that's a little bit uncomfortable because I see myself in there a little bit more than I care to admit. Because I like to pretend I'm good. I like to put on a good face and say, yeah, I'm good, I'm good to go. But the reality is, that's me. I'm continually drawn to do what I think is right, what I think is best, what I think will bring me joy and peace and happiness rather than doing what God says is best. And what Judges is, is it's a reminder that we need something better. We need a better system. These human judges that eventually die can't give us what we need. You see, the other stories that we look at in this series, they they foreshadow the coming of Jesus. In other words, the characters or some element in the story kind of gives us a little taste of what Jesus is going to one day do. But what Judges does, it doesn't as much foreshadow Jesus as it highlights our need for a Savior. The book of Judges shows us there's a problem. It zeroes in on our glaring need. It shows that we have this open wound, that we are incapable of fixing ourselves. The book of Judges shows us that we need a better system. I love how Tim Keller says it. He says, the whole book of Judges shows us that though we are the problem, we cannot be our own solution. We need to search for a king, just as Israel did. See, we are hopeless. 
We are incapable of fixing our problems. So what does God do? What does God do when he notices that we're in distress? What does he do when he notices his people can't do what they need to do? He doesn't shout louder. He doesn't up the ante and say, if you don't do this, then you got something coming for you. No, he comes after us. He pursues his people. He walks in our shoes. He comes after us. That's what we celebrate this time of year is that God came to this earth. He walked in our shoes. He took on our sin. And he paid the price that we deserved. See, God noticed, he recognized that we were incapable of attaining our own righteousness. We couldn't live up. We couldn't live up to the standard that God set. So what does he do? He provides a way for us. He meets us where we're at and gives us a way out. He gives us not what we deserve, but what we need. Maybe the question you wrestle with is, why would God do that? And of course, the church answer is, well, because God loves you. And for certain, God loves us. But I think it goes a little bit further, because I think a lot of us, when we understand or when we think about God loving us, we think, oh, he just loves us because he has to. But I think it goes a little bit further. You see, God doesn't just love you. He likes you. He likes you. He likes who you are. He likes who he's created you to be. He loves you. But he also likes you. And yeah, you got some rough edges, you got some sin, you got some mistake, you got some darkness and evil inside of you, but that doesn't scare him away. God likes you. And hear me on this. That's not an excuse to stay in your sin. That's not an excuse to let that evil inside of you just be there because the creator of the universe likes you. No, that is an opportunity to expose your sin, to expose your darkness so that God can bring healing into your life, so that God can bring the freedom that he's designed you to live in. See, God's not up there waiting to condemn you and beat you over the head when you show the darkness inside of you. No, he's wanting to give you the life he's intended for you to live because he likes you and he wants what's best for you. And you see, our sin, our decision to do what is right in our eyes rather than obey what God says is best, we thought, we thought that would give us what we were ultimately after. We thought that would bring us happiness. We thought that would bring us peace. We thought that would bring us joy and satisfaction. But the reality is it didn't. I mean, maybe for a day or a week or a month or even a year, it brought us some joy. But after a while, it let us down, left us empty. And soon we were chasing after the next thing. We thought if we just get this thing, if we just get that, if we just get him, if we just get her, if we just get a little more money, if we just can do this, if I can just experience this, then finally I will be happy. But we get stuck in the cycle just like the nation of Israel where we're continually pursuing that next thing, trying to get that happiness, that joy, the satisfaction that it can't deliver. You see, our sin has trapped us in the cycle and it's left us empty and we're stuck we're stuck in our mistakes we're stuck in our sin and worst of all we've separated ourselves from God the one who loves us the one who gave up heaven and earth in pursuit of us we've chosen something other than him but God pursued us even in our sin even in our mistakes and he made a way back to him he made a way so that we can live in the freedom we can find the peace that he ultimately wants for us He allowed us to see what sin really is in our life. He allowed us to see the results of what doing what is right in our own eyes brings. He allows us to see that those sin and those decisions are disgusting. Because they can't give us what we thought it would give us. He allows us to see that doing what is right in our own eyes doesn't bring us freedom. It traps us. He allows us to see that when we do what he says is best... That's when we actually find freedom. That's when we can actually live the life he's intended us to live. You see, the beauty of what Jesus has done is he made a way to restore what was good in us. 
so that now we are redeemed, that we are new, we are brought back to the life that he's intended for us to live. Now, do we still have sin? Yeah. Do we still do what's right in our own eyes sometimes? Yeah. But our righteousness, our standing with God is not affected because it's no longer dependent on what you and I do. We no longer have to attain our own righteousness. That is done by Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. So we no longer have to try to get our own righteousness. And again, this isn't an opportunity to sin. This isn't a get out of hell free card. This isn't a, I can do whatever I want now because God is going to forgive me and love me anyway. No. Why would we go back to what entrapped us? Why would we go back to what left us empty? No, this is an opportunity that even though we have this evil that still kind of pulls us away, this is an opportunity for us to continue going back to God so that we can get the life that he intends for us to live, so that we can enter back into a relationship with him. You see, the book of Judges shows us the dire condition that you and I exist in, that we are incapable of fixing ourselves. It shows us the need that we all have, but we live on this side of the cross. And we know the solution that God has given, that he's made a way when there was no way. See, for most of my life, my younger years anyway, I thought I had to attain righteousness. That's how I lived my life. I thought I had to avoid sin. I thought I had to do all the right things on my own. I thought that's how I got God to like me. And that if I kept doing what was wrong, God would eventually one day say, you know what, I've given you enough grace and you keep screwing up. So, you know, I'll still kind of love you because I have to, but I don't like you at all because you keep screwing up. And you know what, you're not even useful to me because you can't get anything right. So I go through my life and I just try to fix myself. I try to do all the right things. I try to avoid all the sin and I got nowhere. Except I got more and more stuck. And I was stuck in this cycle where I just couldn't get anywhere. I felt like I was just continually sinking. And then one day in my, in my early, mid-20s, I realized I was going about this the wrong way. I realized I was trying to attain my own righteousness. I was on my own trying to get things right. And I realized instead of focusing on all the things I should and shouldn't be doing, I should be focusing on Jesus and pursuing him. And so that's what I did. Rather than focusing on, on just the avoidance of sin and just uh, what I should and shouldn't do, I said, you know what, I'm going to focus on God. I'm going to focus on what he says is best. I'm going to focus on, on reading and studying the Bible. I'm going to focus on listening and talking with God. I'm going to focus on getting plugged in with brothers and sisters in, in, in Christ. I'm going to get focused on finding ways to serve uh, God through my gifts and my skills and my passions. And when I made that shift, that's when my faith started really growing. That's when I finally was able to enter into the freedom that God had for me. And that doesn't mean that I never paid attention to sin. No, it just changed the way I approached it. Rather than trying to do it all on my own, all of a sudden now I had God that was helping me through it. I had people in my life that were helping me through it. And yeah, sometimes it was difficult. But I was able to recognize that God was leading me through my sin Not to punish me, but to lead me into the life that he wanted me to live. You see, it was when I started pursuing God, when I started focusing on him, that I was able to enter into the life that God had for me. And listen, this morning, if you aren't a Christian, if you aren't following Jesus, let me just ask you a question I want you to ponder in your head. What is it that you're after? What is it that you want? And if you get it, will it bring you what you hope it will bring you? Or will it leave you empty, like the last thing you thought you needed? See, what Christ is offering you is not a set of rules to follow. It's the freedom that he has for you. It's a way out of that cycle that you're stuck in. It's a way back to a relationship with him. That's what he's offering you. He's offering you to stop doing what you think is right that's not bringing you what you hoped it would. And instead, he's offering you an opportunity to do what he says is right. And that's the only place that you're going to find the freedom and the satisfaction that you are after. Now, there's others of you in the room that you are Christians. You have been following Jesus, some of you for a long time. And listen, the moment that you accepted Jesus... 
The moment you said, I'm in, I'm going to follow you. His sacrifice covered for all your mistakes, past, present, and future. You are now right in his eyes. You are now good in his eyes. You don't have to try to attain your own righteousness anymore. You are in good standing with God. But that doesn't mean that you just get to sit back and not do anything. No, now what we have, the challenge we have as Christians is to shift, to continually shift our focus from doing what we think is best to doing what God says is best. We have the opportunity to, to recognize the lies of what we think will bring us happiness and to follow the truth of what God says will bring us freedom and peace and joy. See, that's what the book of Judges shows us. It shows us what doing what is right in our own eyes gets us. It gets us stuck. It gets us hopeless. It gets us disconnected from God. And it's our job as Christians to focus on what he says is best, to change our thinking. And how do we do that? We just focus on Jesus. We spend time with him. We listen to what he says. We spend time investing in that relationship and reading his word and talking with him and investing in the community that exists within this church and finding ways to serve that use our skills and our gifts and our passions. That's how we focus on Jesus. We continually follow him and pursue him. And we recognize that when we do that, that's when we will find the freedom that he intends for us. It's not when we do what we want. It's when we do what he says. So maybe for you this morning, you have that area of your life that you've been trying and trying and trying to get right. And maybe for you this morning, you instead need to focus on God and together you can deal with that. Maybe you have that area of your life where for years you've just been doing whatever it is you want to do. And this morning it's an opportunity to confess that. To say, God, I'm sorry that I've been doing what is right in my own eyes in this area and bring it to him and let him give you the freedom that he's intended you to live in. Maybe for you, you've become a little stagnant in your faith, a little complacent. And I don't say that as an invitation. I say, or I don't say that as an insult. I say it as an invitation because God is inviting you in that part of your life to step back into the life that he has for you. So this morning, church, you have the opportunity. You have a decision to make. Are you going to do what you think is right, what you think is best? Or are you going to do what God says is best? Because only when we do that will we find the freedom and the joy that God promises us. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. God, we thank you for loving us even when we were doing what was right in our own eyes. God, we thank you for your grace that you continually pour out on us. God, I pray that we can be a church that recognizes the lie that doing what is right in our own eyes will bring us joy and satisfaction. And God, instead, pray that we can be a church that does what you say is right. God, I pray that that is a light to those who see us. pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.